Hey guys, here with chapter 19 vocabulary, or I should say organisms that cause disease. There's a lot of them. Gastrointestinal system's pretty big, and there's a lot of bugs that can make us sick. So hopefully this video will be helpful. The first one that is very clinically important is Clostridium difficile. We'll see with a lot of these organisms, they're ones that can colonize the gut healthily and not cause disease. Um, but if they become overgrown or if there are other stressors, it can cause them to overgrow and cause disease. So Clostridium difficile is particularly problematic in people who are taking um, antibiotics, especially if they're taking long-term antibiotics, because it can wipe some of their good, normal microbiota out of their intestines. And then Clostridium difficile has room to colonize and grow. So Clostridium difficile is really more of a super infection than an infection. It's an overgrowth of a somewhat normal bacterium, but it causes severe diarrhea and it's very hard to keep somebody hydrated. And it's really hard to treat because Clostridium difficile is, is not really treatable with antibiotics. Antibiotics actually worsen the problem because they just kill more good flora. So we've talked about this in class before, but the um, actually like the standard of care right now for, for chronic C. diff infections is actually fecal transplant. So reestablishing those healthy microbes. So Clostridium difficile is a gram positive bacteria, causes acute diarrhea and chronic diarrhea actually. Uh, Clostridium perfringes is another bacteria, another clostridium that can cause, it actually can cause food poisoning. It's also the causative agent of gangrene. So same genus as C. diff, but different disease. Bacillus cereus is one we've used in lab a lot. It is a, an agent of food poisoning. If it gets in food, it can produce a toxin that is acutely toxic. So this is what I keep, we talk, keep talking this semester about the guy who died from eating five-day-old pasta that he left out at room temperature. It got contaminated with Bacillus cereus. The Bacillus cereus made a bunch of toxin, and he consumed it, got food poisoning, and ended up dying. It's not the Bacillus that actually makes you sick. It's the toxin that it produces. Gram-positive bacteria there. Um, another one. Next we have... Oh, Streptococcus mutans and Streptococcus sabrinus. I'm not sure how to say that. These two strains or species of Streptococci are normal on your teeth. They grow on your teeth. Um, but then they also like to metabolize the sugar in the food that you eat. And they produce lactic acid, which degrades the enamel of your teeth. So Strep mutans and Strep sabrinus are two of the, of the types of bacteria that can cause dental caries, also known as cavities in your teeth. So make sure you brush your teeth. Strep mutans is also a cause of endocarditis if that bacteria gets into the bloodstream through, let's say, gum disease or root canal or bleeding gums. Um, it can end up causing an infection in the heart. So strep mutans normally normal in the mouth, but if it gets into the bloodstream or if you feed it too much sugar, it can cause you problems. Staphylococcus aureus, we're becoming very familiar with this one. Normally found on the skin, but can get into basically every other opening and system in the body and cause disease. So within the gastrointestinal system, how it can cause disease is it can cause food poisoning. So if Staph aureus gets onto food, like let's say at a picnic, then um, it can grow on that food and produce a toxin that when you eat the food later, you ingest the toxin and you get sick. And the toxin is very heat stable. So even if you reheat the food and you kill the staph aureus, and so you've killed any bacteria that were contaminating it, the toxin is still there and can still make you sick. So it's not usually deadly or anything, but it does make you violently ill for a little bit. Campylobacter jejuni is a gram-negative bacteria, and it is actually the most common cause of diarrhea. Um, not necessarily clinically, like, uh, or, you know, hospitalization necessary from Campylobacter, but it can be bad. Um, it can also infect the cells of the jejunum, which is part of the small intestine, cause intestinal bleeding, bloody diarrhea. You can hear my daughter's footsteps. She's running around 
trying to not be in the film. She thinks she's a ninja. Uh, maybe I'll give her some Campylobacter jejuni. That should slow her down. Hmm, some diarrhea? No, maybe not. I'm not that evil. Okay. Another important intestinal pathogen is Helicobacter pylori. Now, some people have Helicobacter pylori in their intestines with no problems. Helicobacter pylori is very acid resistant and actually lives in the stomach and sometimes in the duodenum, which is the first part of the small intestine. And it, the disease is associated with our peptic ulcers and duodenal ulcers. It causes ulcers. And it does this by wearing away the mucus layer, the protective mucus layer of the stomach, and then the stomach's acids and enzymes basically start eating away at the stomach tissue. So it, the helicobacter eats away at the protective mucus layer, and then all your body's, your gastric juices do the rest of the damage. Helicobacter pylori. Ulcers used to be thought to be caused by things like stress and spicy food. Turns out as a bacteria, the nice thing is there's antibiotics that can treat it. Used to not be that way. Steck or sugar toxin producing E. coli. Now, E. coli, there's like a bazillion, I don't know, that's an, obviously a hyperbole, but there's a lot of different strains or um, species of E. coli, not species, strains, strains or subtypes of E. coli. And a lot of them are normal residents of the intestines and don't make you sick, but there are several strains of E. coli that um, have evolved primarily in the food system, in guts of animals that we have fed modified diets to in order to fatten them up for meat. And they have picked up genes through uh, transformation, transduction, etc., that make them produce toxins. So shigatoxin producing E. coli has picked up shigatoxin from shigella. And it can cause really bad diarrhea, but it can also cause kidney failure. Guys, shush kids. Salmonella, another uh, foodborne pathogen that can make you sick, cause uh, diarrhea and intestinal distress. Salmonella is found in a lot of animal guts naturally, fish, birds. Um, so it, in contaminated fit, like raw or undercooked fish or bird foods or eggs can be sources of salmonella. So you want to make sure that your meat and eggs and fish are all well cooked, especially on the surface. Gram negative bacteria causes, oh, another other animals that are natural carriers of salmonella, mm -hmm. reptiles. So if you have any pets like turtles, snakes, lizards, wash your hands after playing with them. Shigella is another one. So salmonella, shigella, E. coli are three of the big enteropathogens. They cause disease of the intestines. Shigella is, unlike those others, not a normal resident in animals. This one is actually only found in humans, so it's transmitted specifically from human to human through poor uh, hand hygiene, mostly. So again, oral fecal causes diarrhea. Vibrio cholera is one that is not common in the U.S. anymore, but is still common in a lot of underdeveloped countries. It's caused by a gram-negative bacteria that um, spreads, again, through oral fecal roots. So you eat it, and it causes really, really bad diarrhea, like mucousy diarrhea, so bad that people basically just die from dehydration, from just peeing out of their butts, basically. The treatment for it. With a lot of these, you'll find a lot of um, intestinal bacteria that cause gastrointestinal disease and diarrhea. You can't treat with antibiotics because then you wipe away your good microbes that actually are doing microbial antagonism. So although it's a bacteria, we don't treat it with antibiotics. The treatment for Vibrio cholera is actually just rehydration therapy, making sure you're replacing fluids and electrolytes. And the body will um, end up kicking out the Vibrio cholera. You just have to not get dehydrated in the process of, you have to be able to stay alive while the immune system kills the Vibrio, which in a lot of underdeveloped countries is not as easy as it sounds. This one here, Porphyromonas gingivalis is the only one that I am picking out of that list of several that cause periodontal disease, disease of the gums, and so gingivalis, think gingivitis, gingivo is a combining form that means gums. So this is a disease that it causes gum disease, which the medical term for that is periodontal disease, disease around the teeth. 
Um, next up, now we're into the viruses. First virus family are the hepatitis viruses, and there's, there's actually five of them, but hepatitis D is not actually a virus by itself. It's a satellite virus, it's sort of a piggyback virus, can only infect other cells. So I left it off a list here, A, B, C, and E. They all cause, like the name says, hepatitis, inflammation of the liver. Some of them are bloodborne. Um, some of them are foodborne, so we'll talk more about the specifics of each in class, but for the quiz, know that there's A, B, C, and E. They all cause inflammation of the liver, and they are viruses. <laughs> mumps virus. Mumps is a disease that we vaccinate for. It's part of the MMR vaccine, measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine, so we don't see it that often anymore. It causes a swelling of the lymph nodes, particularly in the, in the neck, so you get these big like lumps, um, really swollen looking kind of cheeks, almost like somebody who's had their wisdom teeth removed. Um, and uh, it's a virus caused by a virus. The disease it causes is called mumps. Again, not so common to see it anymore because of vaccination, but we could start seeing it more because of lack of vaccination. Flipping to the back of my cards, now I've got rotavirus. Rotavirus causes gastrointestinal disease that's pretty severe in small children. It was a major cause of death in children under five until the vaccine came out. So the vaccine came out in 2006 and it's the only oral vaccine that babies get now. So it's not a shot and it is very effective and has vastly reduced the amount of hospitalizations from rotavirus, very serious gastrointestinal bug. Norovirus, very common when you get the stomach flu, when you have that 24, 48-hour stomach bug, it's usually norovirus. It's pretty contagious, spreads pretty quickly. Sometimes called the cruise ship virus because it spreads on cruise ships. When If one person comes on the cruise ship with it, a bunch of people get it because they're all locked in together for a few days. This guy here, Entamoeba histolytica, is a protozoan that can cause intestinal infections, um, primarily from contaminated drinking water. So like if you're out for a hike or something and you drink water from a stream or a pond, or if you're in another country and they use contaminated water sources, you can get this. So it's a protozoan. Protozoan infections tend to be more chronic, cause chronic diarrhea rather than acute diarrhea. So you have it for several weeks or even months. Um, the other one, some other ones that cause acute diarrhea, cryptosporidium is another one. That's a protozoan pathogen. And then the other protozoan one is Giardia lamblia. So these are all sometimes known ca causative agents of traveler's diarrhea that people get in countries where the water is not um, adequately sterilized. Cryptosporidium got into the water system in, I think it was Minneapolis in the 1990s and caused like a massive number of cases of cryptosporidium throughout the city from people drinking tap water. So it's really important that water facilities are contaminating. I think I think it's sensitive to chlorine and they had underchlorinated the water or something like that. Um, Giardia lamblia is a funny looking one and it's also again this one is actually normally found in a lot of wild animal intestinal tracts so when they poop and then their poop runs into rivers then the rivers become contaminated with it so it's an environmental protozoan. All three of these cryptosporidium, Giardia, and Intamoeba histolytica all live just in a lot of environmental water sources, freshwater sources, so it's important to filter or boil your water before you drink it if you're out in nature because you don't want to get a protozoan diarrhea, case of diarrhea. It's usually not fun. Now we're on to the worms. Ascaris lumbricoides is a helminth. It's a nematode, meaning it's a round worm. This is the one that I always show in pictures where somebody basically looks like they're pooping their brains out. They're pooping out tons of worms. Um, Ascaris is pretty big. It looks kind of like if you had a bowl of Ascaris worms, it would look kind of like a bowl of lo mein noodles. Um, that's how big they are. And they actually infect through, uh, that you get them from like contaminated soil and water. Um, so you ingest the eggs, they hatch in the intestines, and then they do this weird thing where they, they actually, the larva will actually swim up through the blood to the lungs, and then you cough up the larva and swallow them back down into the intestines, 
and then it causes some intestinal disease. So it can cause anemia and malnutrition and intestinal blockages if it's a really heavy infection. But most worms cause really chronic disease. Um, what is it called here? Intestinal distress plus migratory system, symptoms. So in, intestinal distress meaning any number of things. You could, could have like a stomach ache from them. You could have some malnutrition. You could have some defecation problems. And from that migra the migratory thing is, you know, during that lung phase, you may have a cough, something like that. So uh, worms, worm infections, that's a big one. Another worm that's important is Enterobius vermicularis. That's one that you may have actually experienced in the U.S. This is pinworm. And pinworm, it says on here that it causes intestinal distress, but it doesn't really cause any symptoms. The most Sim the biggest symptom it causes is an itchy butthole because it lays its eggs around the anus and then usually it's children that transmit the disease. They scratch their butt and they put their hands in their mouth or they put their hands on toys and other kids touch the toys. It gets transmitted pretty quickly through like daycares. Little kids tend to pick it up. They're soil worms too, so kids playing outside in the dirt, sand, can pick it up there as well but not a serious infection, not a serious pathology, easy to treat with an anti-helminthic. Next is Tricurious, sorry, Tricurious Tricuria, which is whipworm. And this is a, also a helminth, it's a nematode, it's a round worm and has like this tapered tail that's really thin, looks like a whip. So that's why it's called a whipworm. And, um, it is one that you actually can get from the soil as well, just like Ascaris. You can get it from eating contaminated soil or food from that has been planted in contaminated soil or drinking water that's contaminated. Um, and it also has one of those weird life cycles where it hatches in the intestine, then goes to the lung, then goes to the throat, and you swallow it down into the intestine. So worms are weird. Um, the last of the round worms, the nematodes, are Nicator and Ancelostoma. Ancelostoma and Nicator are also known as uh, hookworms. So hookworm is a worm that actually these guys infect through the skin. They can they live in the soil and they can actually infect through your skin. So in countries where people like walk around barefoot a lot in the soil, um, and they tend to live in warm soils like warm environments so a lot of people walk around barefoot in those environments and then the worms the larval stages can actually burrow through the skin it's not painful so you don't necessarily know that it's happening and they migrate through the bloodstream to the intestines oh wait no this is one where it migrates through the bloodstream then to the heart then to the lungs you cough it up swallow it down boom it's in your intestines they're weird i don't know why they take such strange paths to get to the intestines, but it's what you got to do, I guess, when you enter through the foot and you need to get to the intestines. So, Nicator, Ancelostoma, also known as hookworms. Tania solium is the tapeworm, a common tapeworm, tapeworm infections. Tapeworms are cestodes, that they're that type of helminth called cestodes, and you get these largely from pigs, undercooked pork, or sometimes undercooked beef. And so you can get a tapeworm in your intestines. It suctions onto your intestinal wall and it uh, can feed on your blood and it absorbs your nutrients through its body, like just absorbs it through its, its skin, if you will. And, um, but the big problem is this other condition it can cause, which is called sister cirrhosis, which is the one listed in your textbook. So it can also cause intestinal distress, which doesn't say in the table. But sister cirrhosis is a condition where when you eat the tapeworm eggs, so if you have poor hygiene and you are pooping out tapeworm eggs and then you accidentally consume them, they can form tapeworm cysts in your body, in your muscles, causing muscle spasms and muscle damage, or in your brain, which is called neurosister cirrhosis, and that can cause permanent brain damage, and that's no good. So don't get a tapeworm. Next, we've got schistosoma. Schistosoma causes schistosomiasis, not something that's endemic to the U.S. 
It's found in South America, the Middle East, and Southeast Asia, warm environments, sort of equatorial regions, where the snail host is found. So schistosoma goes through two host life cycle, goes through snails, and it goes through humans. So the humans shed eggs in their feces, it goes into the water where it infects the snails, the snail it grows through a larval stage in the snail, and it leaves the snail, there's their little swimmers that look kind of like sperm, and they actually burrow through your skin, go through your blood, to your lungs, cough them up, no, nope, just kidding, but they do go through <laughs> to your lungs, there's a lung stage, it goes back into your blood, and then goes to your uh, intestines sorry, the, the vasculature around your intestines. So schistosomas are often called blood flukes. They're the type of helminth that are known as trematodes. They're flukes. And they feed on your blood. So they live in your blood, but the blood, the part of the bloodstream they really like that they mature in and that they ultimately are migrating to is the hepatic portal vein, which is the vein between your intestines and your liver. It's basically, it's, it's the blood vessels that carry nutrients from your intestines that you've just uh, like eaten to your liver. So it's like literally the nu most nutrient rich blood in your body. So they're pretty smart to locate themselves there. So they just live there and basically steal your nutrients. But the big problem is that they lay lots of eggs and the eggs often get lodged in the liver. So they cause liver disease, schistosomiasis. Uh, the biggest problem with schistosomiasis is liver, chronic liver disease. Um, oh, that's the end. Took long enough. <laughs>